Okay, so we're live. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to today's Rises session on Italy. My name is Manuela Andaloro. I'm an advisor on social trends, economic impact and culture, um, expert in marketing and communications, public affairs. I've had a career in finance, and I'm passionate about diversity and responsible leadership. In the past 20 years, I've worked for both the private and public sector in Milan, London, and Zurich. I have the pleasure to be here today to moderate some great talks about Italy and to discuss with leading professionals from the government and the private sector how a strong and resilient recovery in post-pandemic Italy is possible and is happening. A little background first. Italy is a member of the G7, the Eurozone's third largest economy, and was the first European country to face the COVID-19 pandemic in early 2020. A recent New York Times article titled How Mario Draghi is Making Italy a Power Player in Europe, detailing how the Prime Minister is leveraging his European relationship relationships and a solid reputation to make Italy a force on the continent. When in late March the EU was stumbling through a COVID-19 vaccine rollout coupled with shortages and logistical challenges, Draghi took matters into his own hands by seizing a shipment of vaccines destined for Australia and showing that a new aggressive and strong force had arrived on the European bloc. The so-called Australia experiment, as officials in Europe call it, was a turning point for Europe and for Italy. With Chancellor Merkel of Germany leaving office in September and President Macron of France facing very tough elections next year, Draghi seems to be poised to fill a leadership vacuum in Europe, showing that Italy is now punching above its weight. On April 28, the Italian Parliament approved the so-called Italian National Reform and Resilience Plan, which foresees reforms and investments to be implemented in the span of the next five years. With a total value of 235 billion euros, the Italian Recovery Plan is the largest in Europe and the one on which all eyes will be on. So... About 40% of the recovery plan will be spent on green projects and 27% will be dedicated to digitalization of the economy. Bank of Italy indications of last week show production regaining strong momentum, fresh investments and an accelerating economy with a 4% GDP growth shown so far in 2021, up to 45 according to the OECD or even 5% according to Fitch. Also due to the pandemic, Italian companies and families have saved over 140 billion euros or 9% of GDP. On June 1st, during a public event, Minister Draghi said Italy is alive, strong and has a great desire to restart. The months of the pandemic were very tough, but we're now facing a phase of recovery and trust on which to build a fairer and more modern country and to release the energies that are so still in recent years. So will a strong recovery gradually take shape and become as impactful as data indicators seem to show? Also, can technology promote a new model beyond GDP to measure a modern country's wealth, well-being and sustainability while guaranteeing sustainable growth? Today, we're here with leading Italian experts for both the government and the private sector to discuss some of the key aspects of the future of the country and of Europe to talk digitalization, innovation, culture and green revolution. So without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed panelists who will help us gaining insights and strong understanding of these topics. Costanza Armanin is a politician and policy leader fellow at the European University Institute in Florence, a professional with experience as a public official, advocate, lecturer and party leader. Her work as analyst is centered on the institutions and policies of the EU, social inequalities, justice and migration. Her current main project at the European University Institute focuses on fostering inclusive leadership in Europe, based on her experience as creator of the first Italian school for political empowerment of women called Prime Donne. Marco Bentivogli is a politician and the national coordinator of Base Italia. He was secretary general of the Italian Federation of Metal Workers, CISL, from 2014 to 2020, and professor of practice at South Business Schools. He is an expert in labor and innovation policies, and since January 19, he's been a member of the Commission on Artificial Intelligence set up at the Ministry of Development. Emanuela Girardi is the founder of Pop AI. Popular Artificial Intelligence, member of the high-level expert group on AI of the Italian Minister of Economic Development, MISE, co-lead of CLARE Task Force on AI and COVID-19, and member of the board of the Italian Association on Artificial Intelligence. And Daniele Di Fausto, the CEO of EFM, one of the most important voices on the themes of workplace evolution, sustainability and open innovation, and he's the founder of Venture Thinking, a worldwide ideas accelerator that creates short circuits between the business world and that of 
philosophy and culture, generating innovative solutions and social impact. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Let's dive straight in and discuss the uh, National Recovery and Resilience Plan, which was launched by the Draghi government to restart, reboot, if we want, the Italian economy. Of course, uh, there is a strong need to transform the current economic model towards one of greater environmental, but also social sustainability. So uh, perhaps, you know, if we could start with Marco and Costanza, but it's really a question for all of you. What are the key principles that we should restart from? And if we think of social sustainability, sustainability, what are the real opportunities, especially for segments that were hit and have suffered most in the pandemic, such as women and younger generations? Marco? Costanza? Who should go first, please? Please, first. ladies first. Lady first. Okay. So, first of all, thanks for the introduction and for organizing this excellent panel. I think there was a need to, to do so, given that Italy is taking the larger share of the next generation EU and uh, generally the, the funding that the European Union put at the disposal of member states for the, for the recovery, basically. So all eyes are um, pointed on Italy, especially because of this. We are spending also other people money. Uh, coming to your question, it's true that there are segments of the population which have been suffering the most. Obviously, these are more or less the same all over Europe, but in Italy, women and young people experience special conditions because we have uh, one amongst the highest unemployment rates uh, among the, the young population in between 15 and 24 is like 33%, whereas the general unemployment rate is around 10% and is increasing. And we have a, a like 3 million young people who are not looking for a job and are not studying. I mean, this is a very awful record. And we have a record on women as well, because we have the highest difference in Europe in between the men and women employment rate is like 20% with less than half of the women working age population actually working. And the participation rate is the lowest in, in Europe. So finally, with this recovery and resilience plan, these priorities are recognized meaning that they are the horizontal principles upon which the plan is based. But let's be clear, I mean, this is, was a specific request from the European Commission <laughs> in January. They issued guidelines for the yes. 27 member states and they asked the member states to do so. So thanks to the European Commission, we are focusing our eyes on these two categories. They are trans cross-cutting priorities but as you know I mean the social expenditure for within the plan is 10% of the entire plan so I'm not sure we are doing enough really because of the social expenditure portion which is low um, and the portion of uh, research and education which is like 13% of the plan so it's not very much too Obviously, if you dedicate 40% to the environment and almost 30% to digitalization, very important, there is little left for the other people. But let's say that the principles are there, but maybe the money isn't really there. So we, we need to see what the real opportunities are. Thank you, Costanza. <laughs> Thank you. Marco? Oh, you're on mute, Marco. Sorry. Il PNRR, eh, I, I need to, to, to talk in Italian because I, I am in the middle of the train. That's no problem. Il, il PNRR italiano è, è stato riscritto quasi interamente perché eh, nel documento del precedente governo c'erano solo una somma di, infinita di progetti e soltanto delle linee guida. So you're saying the previous the previous uh, recovery plan written by the previous Conte government had mostly guidelines but no real implementation instructions. 
il nuovo documento eh, affronta in maniera diretta il grande problema italiano e lo fa nella sua introduzione comparando la crescita di produttività in Italia negli ultimi dieci anni che è stata del 4% comparata con quella di Francia e Germania che hanno superato il 2%. So the latest version, which was then presented at the EU, uh, goes full on and tackles figures and compares countries and tries to build um, stronger strategies to be able to tackle the problem at its root. Okay. Yep. Da questo punto di vista, l'impianto fondamentale accanto rispetto agli altri paesi, accanto alle diverse missioni, riguarda la riforma di eh, molti aspetti della, eh, dello Stato, della vita pubblica del Paese, dell'organizzazione dello Stato e della pubblica amministrazione, della giustizia, del fisco, perché attualmente sono tra le zavorre e i limiti di questa crescita di produttività. So uh, one of the, uh, the main points and the main advantages as well of the new, of the new uh, recovery fan, fund uh, tackles problems such as public administration, bureaucracy, justice and helps in a way by removing obstacles that have bogged down in a way uh, the system for a long time. Removing obstacles should help boosting productivity. Thank you, Marco. Okay. Thank you. Um, there is a very interesting book which was recently released called uh, To Hell and Back uh, by the economist Carlo Cottarelli. And in that book, he strongly emphasizes the aspect of social mobility, meritocracy and solidarity. These aspects are of vital importance for any country. And of course, we are no exception. Um, if we think of the writer as Rapound, he was a prophet of the economic crisis of the modern world, and he criticized the system and places a bit the blame and the origin of inequalities in the economic exploitation. He writes, you cannot make a good economy with bad ethics. So with that in mind, how can we level and boost the drivers of meritocracy? This is a question for everybody, but perhaps we start again quickly with Constanze and Marco, and then we have a quick round. The meritocracy aspect, I think it's very important in all sectors. Constanze. It is. It is indeed. It is indeed. But the, the crucial question here is how you match meritocracy with... Um, um, with inequalities, existing inequalities. So you have been citing a lot of authors. I'll add one because I've just finished a book which is called The Tyranny of Meritocracy by Professor Sandel of Harvard. And um, he points out how our liberal societies are pointing everything on meritocracy without really dealing with existing social uh, inequalities. So as a matter of fact, meritocracy becomes something that, okay, partly depends of, on whether somebody is clever and somebody is committed and hard worker, but to a large extent, it derives from where you come from, from a family background and from an economic uh, point of view. So I think we are putting together the two perspectives you were, you were mentioning, Manuela, uh, before, but we are not tackling them. We aren't tackling them at all. And here I talk about something that is really important, according to me, to make change happen vis-a-vis -vis the like women, youth, and the most fragile portions of the population. We rely on meritocracy, but we have no meritocracy when it comes to leadership, especially top political leadership. Yes, absolutely. Because let's be, let's be clear, I mean, in order to implement change, you have to have change from above. Uh, the National Recovery and Resilience Plan has been written by the existing Italian leadership, which is composed of a certain set of population. So their attention to the most fragile sections of the population has been, of course, uh, solicited by others, but you would need a more diversified leadership in order to really tackle those issues, to be aware of them and to be in contact with these portions of the population. Whereas in the end, I mean, when you talk about uh, political leadership and meritocracy in Italy, in the end, the present discourse is always, well, if 
we select the leadership according to meritocratic, meritocratic principles, both in politics, but we could say the same for the private sector. And my reply is, well, dears, if you if meritocracy was really there and other concerns would not impact on meritocracy, then you would have statistically half of the leadership made of women and a portion of leadership made of young people. So this is simple maths, right? But it has an extremely strong influence on the policies you are going to to implement. And uh, if we don't act on our conception of leadership and on this uh, really, I mean, inequalities at that level, then we can do little to really implement and take account of this mismatch in between how we can see meritocracy and how we our society is uh, stratified in a sense. Okay, this was a little theoric, but I think I made the concrete example, which is Italy. I could give you numbers, but I won't. No, thank you. Thank you, Costanza. There was actually a panel on the topic this morning. Um, I was attending, and unfortunately, it is a global problem. I mean, we, um, we're not different in this regard. Meritocracy and uh, leadership are two uh, key words or buzzwords these days, and uh, no country is really making uh, significant progress. Or if they are, it's not always... Uh, uh, benchmarked in uh, in the political system or in uh, high up the ranks in large organizations. Marco, what do you think? Say, uh, are you you're mute? Sorry. Eh, eh, sono molto d'accordo con quello che diceva Costanza. Aggiungo un altro punto di vista che riguarda più specificatamente le questioni del lavoro. E il eh, nostro è un paese dove e la valutazione oggettiva sul lavoro è un, uh, un miraggio. Yeah, so uh, um, I agree with Costanza, you agree with Costanza, but specifically when it comes to the world of work, actually, the, the situation and the discussion is actually even worse. There is very little meritocracy when it comes to the world of work. E noi accanto al um, riconoscimento del valore legale del titolo di studio non abbiamo un sistema condiviso di riconoscimento delle competenze delle persone. This is very important. So next to the recognition of uh, university titles and, and assorted degrees, there isn't a yeah, structure or there isn't a framework to recognize actually the skills and the competences of people. E eh, questo diciamo fa il paio con i sistemi di inquadramento professionale nel lavoro delle persone che sono eh, quasi tutti datati attorno al 1970, cioè un vecchio lavoro in cui eh, vengono eh, eh, descritte, eh, valutate e remunerate solo le mansioni delle persone e non i loro ruoli all'interno dell'organizzazione del lavoro. So this is coupled uh, with also a fairly archaic model of ranking uh, within the organizations and within the different sectors, which recognizes only years of work, but not really the skills and capabilities. So it doesn't really have a holistic approach. Eh, da, in ultimo, questo un po' spiega eh, perché nonostante eh, la parità di retribuzione ha una fonte del diritto tra le gerarchie più alte esistenti al mondo perché nella nostra Costituzione repubblicana. So this explains why at the highest ranks e arrivati nel, nel lavoro eh, il riconoscimento della professionalità per i motivi che dicevo non è oggettiva e per cui eh, no. eh, le, anche questioni come il gender gap. No, eh, no, alla fine no. riguardano soprattutto il riconoscimento del oggettivo della professionalità delle persone. So this this actually could refer back to constitutional uh, uh, values and, and laws. Uh, the, the challenge seems to be that uh, the value of and the competence and um, 
that people and work and the workforce can bring is not recognized and properly um, uh, portrayed. And that, of course, leads also to a uh, problem in, uh, in, the, uh, in the current gender pay gap, which later we will talk about and gender pension gap. Grazie, Marco. What about Emanuela and Daniele? What is your, your take on meritocracy? Maybe in, in one short minute. Hi, I start. Uh, hi, everybody, I'm Manuela, and thank you for inviting me today. And referring to this uh, this topic, I think, that, uh, like uh, Costanza and Marco already said, I, mean, I agree with them, and I think that we really need a cultural change. And um, I think that this is really, I mean, we really need to invest in education, like I mean, the Next Generation EU Italian Plan is doing, because we have about 30 billion in, uh, in education. And I think that this is really the starting point, because we need to um, really to change the mentality, the mindset uh, in Italy, but also in Europe. And we really need to show some role model to show that, uh, I mean, it is possible, I mean, the starting from, uh, from zero, from scratch, uh, and to reach really the top level. And this needs um, a change in mindset and in culture. And I think that the only way we can really make this happening is really starting from education. So starting teaching this in, in school, in elementary school, primary school, all the way up to universities and uh, in a very structured way. So to me, the key is really, I mean, cultural change through educational program. And role models yes, that people can be inspired by. Very interesting. Thank you, Manuela. Daniele, I saw you were nodding. Good morning. Good morning. It's a very pleasure. I, I agree with the other uh, with the other speaker. What I, I can do more is a point that uh, in this phase, the post-pandemic uh, crisis, uh, we need uh, more innovation, more uh, creativity. And I think that there is a big uh, correlation between uh, innovation, creativity, and diversity. So diversity and innovation are two big uh, variables to put together. And I think that uh, now we are forced to think new ideas. And so there is a necessity for innovation and creativity to put uh, 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 together diversity as a, an enabling factor. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's proven, right? That diverse boards, diverse governments and diverse companies manage um, to succeed, have higher um, ROI, uh, return on equity, uh, the higher, they're just more successful and they avoid the uh, group thing, so-called. So perhaps given we're talking about this, let's go straight to another key point of the recovery plan. There is something called, this is a question for everybody. I know that the, the leading specialist on this today in our panel is Costanza, but I want to discuss the certificate of gender equality, which is part of the recovery plan and is thought to support companies in reducing gender gap in terms of equal pay, career opportunities, also very important, and maternity protection. We know that a global level, for example, of the CEOs who lead companies on the 2020 Fortune 500 list, just 6% are women. What does that mean? Why? Where there is a lot of barriers for women to rise through the top, right? And to move up through the ranks. How do we overcome those barriers? There is this glass uh, ceiling index. It's done annually and shows Italy 13th out of 29 countries above the OECD average, above countries like, like the US, Britain, Switzerland, or Germany, which ranks 22nd. But gender equality as we know, it's far from being achieved and gender pay and gender pension gap, even even most worryingly, is widening due to the pandemic. And globally, actually, initiatives are, are just not working. It, it doesn't seem so. So they're being ineffective and we've also struggled to measure them. So how, um, Costanza, if gender equality means more value for a company, more growth, I mean, it seems like a no brainer. How do we make success measurable? What criteria and parameters can we deploy? Well, thanks for, for the question, which is very, really very dear to, to my heart. We are, I mean, we can see we have been talking about the National Plan for Recovery and Resilience, and we see that already there, there are some instruments that have been introduced, like this certificate of gender equality for, for companies. Now, this is really nothing new because at the international level, there is already this EDGE, you know, which is the economic uh, uh, debate for gender equality that has been awarded to public organization like the European Space Agency, as well as private organization. What is that? Is a certificate that um, 
uh, basically according to various measurable criteria, like how many women are in leadership, as you were mentioning, pay, um, gender pay gap and uh, uh, length of uh, time before being promoted um, qualifies a company or an organization for being uh, an equality champion, let's say. So we didn't have this kind of certificate of gender equality. It exists, something like that, but it wasn't recognized or used for public procurement. What we are seeing now is that at the national level, these criteria gender procurement and gender certification is um, included and established for for accessing the fund of the Recurrent Resilience Fund. Um, but uh, obviously this hasn't been detailed yet. Hopefully we'll look at international examples to, to implement it. In the private sector, there is much more uh, attention to this because as you were mentioning, we know that there are uh, direct economic benefits from having a more diverse uh, workforce. Um, in the public sector, we still think that we're only talking politically correct and that there aren't benefits derived from, from this kind of including more women. There is Banca d'Italia, the Italian National Bank has projected that if we close the gender pay gap, for instance, and the gender employment gap, sorry, we would have a seven percent increase in our um, in our GDP per year. So there are studies that demonstrate that these measures are are important. Let me add to certificate of gender equality and gender procurement that I just discussed. Also, pay transparency. There is a a proposal at the European and also one at the national level. I mean, yeah. there there should be criteria for pay transparency. Gender impact assessments of public measure. We do that for the environment. We can do this for women and men. I mean, the data are there. They are even clearer than than, than the indicators for 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 uh, the environment yeah. and yeah. gender budgeting, which is something that we can also do uh, very easily to assess how um, organizations uh, spend. Tell us a little bit more about gender budgeting. Well, gender budgeting is is a form of analyzing budgets in order to check their effects in terms of uh, workplace creation or uh, not only externalities like positive externalities, like in terms of having more women than taking public transports, having more men taking public transports with specific policy lines. So it's a way in which organizations assess their impact, but they differentiated their impact on men and women. An example, Fantastic. our mm -hmm. national plan for resilience and recovery dedicates 60% of the funding to... Um, Green projects, environmental transitions, and yes, the yeah. digital transition. Yeah, this creates mainly male jobs. It's easy to do an assessment of their, of their how the, the funds will impact on uh, on that. And the principles of gender budgeting say, okay, you do this impact, then you go back in the policy cycle, and next time you, you know, you plan your budget in a way that reflects your finding, the finding of the budgeting. This That's very idea. interesting. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Costanza. Emanuela, you work in a, if we can call it that way, in a fairly perhaps male-dominated environment, right, given the, the main discipline that you're an expert on. What is your view and your experience and perhaps all suggestions on how to address this? Well, I, I think that, I mean, I agree 100% with what Costanza just said. And I think that, I mean, um, what we are doing, I mean, this new policy that we are developing, they really show that increasing gender equality, I mean, will benefit society as a whole. I mean, we've seen the examples and the data that Costanza provided as a, so the increase in GDP, uh, the impact assessment and so on. So I think that this is really important because everybody is really understanding. So we have the awareness point of view that is really understanding how 
important it is not only for women, but for the overall society to increase gender equality. And this, I think, should be, I mean, it is already one of the mission of the Italian Resilience and Recovery Plan, but also the European one. And it should be really one of the priorities because this will really increase I mean, the benefits for everybody. And of course, I mean, as I mentioned before, we need a role model because especially in STEM, we have at the moment uh, something between 10, 15, 16, 70 percent of women in a top position. But we start having some changes here as well, because, for instance, I mean, if you heard the news of the last uh, days of uh, Samantha Cristoforetti, she will be the yes. first chief of the International Space Station next year. And then we have, I mean, uh, like in Europe, we have several examples of women who are really reaching the top position. And this is really showing that, uh, I mean, with this new um, leadership style, I mean, also we will have a positive impact uh, in the overall uh, companies, industry and society. So I think that this is really, I mean, um, a positive path that we just uh, undertaken. So we are on a very positive path. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic news. And uh, I think you just shared also some fantastic best practices and examples. And I think there is more coming. Um, while we, we discuss, um, you know, this topic, I think uh, this is a very important plan of the plan of the uh, part of the recovery plan. But there is also a lot of the budget that will go into digitalization. And so uh, there is a part that outlines a long term strategy um, for a sustainable development, for example, of AI, presenting key objectives to increase the development of AI, but also to make the country very competitive in the field. And I think we have some also best practices and success stories there. Could you give us an overview of where Europe first, perhaps, and then Italy also stand with regards to strategy, connectivity, and also related investments? And there is a lot of talks about this EU digital compass and how, what is it exactly, and how is Italy positioned within the next generation EU plan for AI? Emanuela, and also everybody else is free to sure. the interview. So basically what happened is that Europe started a little bit later than US and China in developing an AI strategy. But it is not such bad news because basically, I mean, it turned into something positive because it gave really Europe the opportunity of developing a vision that was based on, on European values. And uh, Europe could really promote a European ecosystem where AI technologies and AI system could be developed in a safe and secure way and could be used to improve a European citizens' life. So to achieve this European vision of that it's called the trustworthy and human-centric AI, so that puts human in the center and develops um, AI strategies that have to have the goal to improve uh, human life, citizens' life. And uh, what European Commission did presented a few weeks ago, the Digital Compass. The Digital Compass is a program that is based on four cardinal direction points. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, uh, these points uh, have to be achieved uh, in the next decade. And the four points are, the first one that we already mentioned before, it was mentioned by Marco, is the, the skills, so digital skilled population and how highly skilled digital professional. The second one is to secure a, a substantial digital infrastructure. The third point, uh, it's uh, about business industry, so to, to ensure a digital transformation of European industry. And the last point is probably one of the most important ones, and it's uh, referring to the public sector, so the digitalization of public sector. So basically, with this uh, overall strategy, um, the goal uh, is to develop, like we mentioned before, a sort of a new sustainable economic model that will bring the um, economical, social, and environmental sustainability into the European economy, basically. So if we look at Italy, and if we, if we look at this for areas, Areas. These are even more important in the Italian system and society because, as we mentioned before, we have a kind of a bigger gap to fill to reach this four goal of the digital compass. So if we look, for instance, at the digital skill, uh, in Italy we have an average of 42% of the population which have uh, basic digital skill compared to to compare that to 58% of the European average. And the goal of the digital compass is to have 85% of the population by 2030 with not only digital, not only basic, but I mean, substantial, uh, so high digital skills. And so you see that uh, this means that we really invest, uh, need to invest a lot of education. And for instance, uh, in the Italian Recovery and Resilience Plan, we have a 32 billion investment in education. So it's a really important sum, and I'm very confident 
confident that we will be able to develop uh, very effective plans to reach this goal. Uh, just to give you a, a couple of other examples for infrastructure or for the digital transformation of business, what were it is being planned in the Italian Next Generation EU plan. For instance, for infrastructure, we have a budget of 32 mil billion um, euro to be invested in infrastructure, infrastructure to improve the communication across Italy and logistics. So we have railways, ports, uh, roads, uh, and so on. And if we look about, uh, if you look at the um, connectivity infrastructure, we have six billion investment planned to improve connectivity. So to bring basically high speed internet to schools, to companies, to citizens and to public administration. So it's really some, I mean, huge and solid plan that we're looking at here. And it, the last two points of the digital compass, if we look at these areas in Italy, so the digitalization of companies, it's the first mission of the Italian next generation EU plan. And we have 50 billion euro investment plan in these areas to improve the competitiveness of the Italian industry. And um, the last part, which is the, the public administration, which in Italy, I mean, is really like probably has the biggest gap to fill. And uh, there are lots of uh, plans uh, that are being under development at the moment to improve the digitalization of uh, public administration in Italy to start um, also in this way, I think we need a change cultural. So we need to change the process, we need to change the cultural, we need to bring skills, uh, and we need to start collecting data so to be able to use data and to bring also the artificial intelligence technologies to improve the process uh, and the services. So I think that I'm very confident that we, I mean, we, we really, we will invest well, I would say. I mean, these funds coming from um, Europe and we will be able to cover this gap. And this is because on one side, we have the bigger gap to cover. So we cannot go wrong this time, but we have the funds in this moment. And then we have a good technical team that uh, are very reliable. We were talking about reputational image trust at the beginning of the panel. So we have this team that develop a very solid plan and that will also take care of the implementation and the control and monitoring of this plan. So I think that, uh, I mean, we, I'm, I'm very confident about this. And last point is that most of these projects are European projects. So if you look about the, at the infrastructure project, there are lots of infrastructure projects that are uh, developed at the European level. For instance, Gaia X, that it's the European Federated Cloud or quantum computing, um, high performance computing. So there are really lots of European projects that are really, I mean, under development and Italy is highly involved and is playing a leading role in this project as well. This is fantastic news, Emanuela. So a power player also in the digital space. And in the next five years, we should see the results of all of the work that has been done and that has gone into it. Uh, there is a couple of things also that you said that I would like to, uh, to discuss a little bit further. You mentioned education, the value of education, how important it is, but also th that probably refers to also schools and university and so on. But there is something that increasingly we hear about and we talk about, which is the lifelong learning. And, and that also goes in the direction if we talk, if we think about one of the key consequences of the pandemic is, you know, how it will affect work, the way we work, how we work. There is a structural problem there. There is, you know, office space and there is the understanding of how digital working will be done in the future, so-called in Italy smart work. But also there is the... Um, uh, the, the very important topic of uh, ongoing learning and how do we tackle that? So from a, from a soft perspective, how do we ensure that in their life, uh, their long working lives, individuals will always be able to be up to date and have the right skills at the right time? Uh, there is a very important um, report from McKinsey, I think very recent, that, uh, that, that shows how actually increasingly yearly we need to keep each, um, ourselves updated and up to speed or we will miss out and machines and AI and so on will do our jobs um, and on the other hand we have the uh, structural and infrastructure challenges which perhaps we can start with that Daniel and then we go back to the human factor and human capital topic which is also impor so important Daniele what do you think uh, I think that uh, we have now a, a fantastic opportunity uh, because uh, considering the workplace situation uh, what we need to consider uh, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. Pre-pandemic situation, we had in general in Italy a situation in which 50% uh, of the space was not used uh, by, uh, by private companies. 50% pre-pandemic style. 
And the difference between a public um, and private uh, was that the average of uh, an employee in use of, of the space was uh, 10 square meter per employee in a public, in a private company and 45 square meter for a, a, pri- a public company. So 45. We, 45. So if we consider this a big gap between a public and private pre pandemic, and now we apply the situation of a smart working or remote working in consideration that two days or three days a company will work from remote, it means that there is a huge, a huge uh, space in which we can define a new infrastructure of uh, space management, especially in the public sector. We estimate with venture thinking uh, a budget of saving in the public administration is a uh, 36 billion per year saving uh, in uh, restructuring the space infrastructure. What we need to do with this money, not only to take uh, to have a saving, uh, but uh, this is the second point, uh, the engagement level of work. So if we consider the engagement level worldwide, uh, only 15% of employees have engagement uh, in, in their work environment. In Europe, we have 10% and in Italy, we have 5%. So it means that here in the engagement, we have a big, big challenge and we need to invest in education, in training, in giving to the workplace a new vision, a new, a new let me say, way to fulfill what in Italy we are very, very good is the genius logic. So the place can be a changing factor to establish a deep transformation in creating a relationship in learning through others, uh, in connecting, creating diversity. So if we put these two things together, with, I think that we can uh, switch uh, how the work is organized. And in pre-pandemic, uh, we think about corporation in their headquarters. So office and work were the same things. Now I think that uh, what, we can, what we need to do is to change the proposition and to move from an headquarter to an upquarter. So the city must become a place in which we can work everywhere. We have the possibility not only to work only from, from uh, home or to work only from office, but we need to, have, to create the condition to have experience with other people. And if we put on experience, we can learn more on doing than only listening. So there is a big transformation that if we address in the right way, we can get the connection of uh, long life journey learning and working. So learning and working will be the same, but we need to invest in skills, in capabilities, in connection and network. So and this is the possibility and money and savings can be, uh, can be obtained uh, transforming uh, public administration and, and, uh, and uh, even private. And Emanuela, just the last things, uh, what I'm seeing uh, in Italy is, uh, is a very big uh, and positive things. Uh, corporation, so big companies like Enel, like Leonardo, are coming together and they are sharing their spaces between companies. So there is the possibility to create uh, an ecosystem of companies uh, in which the space uh, becomes like mobility. The car with digital transformation has uh, transformed mobility in a sharing economy. I think that the space can be transformed in a sharing economy as well. And so we need to open our space to other and to give access, accessibility to a lot of people. These are fantastic takeaways. And we also seem to be on the right path on this topic, too. So there is a lot of hope, which is our time is nearly up. But one final question to all of you, maybe one very quick takeaway is a citizen. Um, what is your hope, your fear, but also your certainty? I think Emanuel already mentioned in part in relation to this strong restart and recovery for the country, but also for Europe. Marco. Marco, you're mute. In realtà la risposta è in quello che diceva adesso Daniele Di Fausto, cioè se eh, quest, questi cambiamenti che il digitale già aveva avviato prima della pandemia, e cioè lo scongelamento del tempo e dello spazio di lavoro, appunto non più eh, freeze, non più congelati per tutta la vita, per tutta la settimana, per tutto il mese, in realtà eh, dobbiamo fare in modo che si possa accompagnare la costruzione di architetture nuove del lavoro, dell'economia, dell'industria, del sociale e proprio per questo bisogna 
fare questo lavoro di ripensamento, di redesign degli spazi d'azienda, degli spazi della città, fare in modo che la città sia policentrica e verde e che i rientri in azienda, in tutto il mondo c'è questo lavoro ibrido un po' in presenza, un po' remotizzato, e i rientri in azienda sono preziosissimi, ma sono preziosi se si rientra in spazi che abilitano le relazioni sociali, la condivisione strategica, la dimensione di cura e di comunità aziendale, altrimenti eh, abbiamo